It is perhaps a silly question to ask, but is King Charles III a druid? There are actually a few interesting reasons why this inquiry might be taken a bit more seriously than it first appears. Not least the mention of his mother and regnal predecessor, Queen Elizabeth II, allegedly being a druid, as was pointed out in the comments to my previous video on the green man appearing on the official invitation to the coronation. I do read the comments with interest and thank you for them. So, with that in mind, the best place to start would be the late Queen's apparent druidism. The then Princess Elizabeth was invested as honorary ovate of the Gorseth of the Bards of Wales at the National Estethford of Wales on the 6th of August 1946. Dressed in ancient robes and surrounded by druids, the young princess was invested as an honorary bard at Mountain Ash. Her bardic name was Elizabeth O. Windsor, and her experience at the traditional ceremony heralded the start of a long interest in the Welsh language and culture. However, this interest in the Brythonic language of Welsh was ultimately not enough to maintain her druidic status, and she lost her bardic title in 2006 when a rule change meant only people who spoke Welsh could be a member. Despite being the Prince of Wales before taking on the mantle of King, Charles III was afforded no such ceremony by the Gorseth of the Bards. So far, so definitive. However, Charles's links to Celtic paganism do not end here, and were brought into sharp focus recently, just prior to his coronation. My previous video, link in the description, examined the presence of the Green Man on the official invitation to King Charles and Queen Camilla's coronation. This is despite the King's title of Defender of the Faith, the faith in question being unequivocally Anglican Protestantism. The prominent horned deity on the invitation card was the most striking feature of a piece bedecked with greenery and powerful heraldic symbolism. The invitation for the coronation was designed by Andrew Jameson, a heraldic artist and manuscript illuminator whose work is inspired by the chivalric themes of Arthurian legend. This brings us to another figure who was connected to the Arthur legend and Druidism. The Vita Merlini, or Life of Merlin, strongly thought to have been penned by Geoffrey of Monmouth in around 1150, unsurprisingly details the life of Merlin. But how accurate this publication can be, being several centuries after the attested and alleged real setting of the figure known as Myrdin, is open to debate. The Vita does, however, serve as a useful allegorical device in understanding, among other things, the folkloric nature and historiography of this mysterious figure. Merlin, or Melinus, as he is rendered in Latin, is described as being a prophet and a bard of sorts. This places him in potential druid territory, as has been theorised by several authors. This bardic presentation is, according to some, a euphemistic allusion to his knowledge of oral history and ritual, allegedly consistent with pagan druidic practices. It is important here to differentiate between the Gorseth of the Bards of Wales and the far earlier and far more mysterious ancient druidic priestly class that existed in Britain and Gaul, now France, before and for some time during the Roman occupation. For its part, the Gorseth was established in 1792 by Iolo Morganwig as part of a romantic harping back to a Celtic past, but more on that later. For now, let's look at what we know about the original Druids. The caste known as Druids acted as priests, teachers and judges, with the earliest known records of them coming from the 3rd century BC. Their name may have come from a Celtic word meaning Noah of the Oak Tree. But in point of fact, very little is known for certain about the Druids, who kept no written records of their own, and are thought to have relied on oral history through poetic or musical recitation. In 54 AD, Julius Caesar, who is the principal source of information on the ancient Druids, recorded his observations about them. His testimony may not be entirely reliable, since they were the enemies of the Romans, and therefore he may have embellished his claims to denigrate them and exaggerate their barbarism. This could certainly be the case in Caesar's mention of human sacrifice and raising the spectre of the terrifying wicker man. Caesar may also have plagiarised part of his account from the Stoic philosopher Poseidonius, whose own testimony appears to have been borne out by medieval Irish sagas. But these, of course, were not contemporary with the Roman occupation, being many centuries later. With that caveat-laden historical throat-clearing out of the way, Caesar's account read, The Druids are in charge of all religious matters, superintending public and private sacrifices, and explaining superstitions. A large crowd of young men who flock to them for schooling hold the Druids in great respect.
for they have opinions to give on almost all disputes involving tribes or individuals, and if any crime is committed, any murder done, or if there is contention about a will or the boundaries of some property, they are the people who investigate the matter and establish rewards and punishments. Any individual or community that refuses to abide by their decision is excluded from the sacrifices, which is held to be the most serious punishment possible. Those thus excommunicated are viewed as impious criminals. They are deserted by their friends and no one will visit them or talk to them to avoid the risk of contagion from them. They are deprived of all rights in court and they forfeit all claims to honours. There is one archdruid or supreme power. On his death he is succeeded either by someone outstanding among his fellows or, if there are several of equal calibre, the decision is reached by a vote of all the druids and the election is sometimes managed by force. At a fixed time of year they assemble at a holy place in the territory of the Carnutes, which is thought to be the centre of Gaul. Anyone with a grievance attends and obeys the decisions and judgments which the Druids give. The general view is that this religion originated in Britain and was imported into Gaul, which means that any keen student of Druidism now goes to Britain for information. The whole Gallic nation is virtually a prey to superstition, and this makes the serious invalids or those engaged in battle or dangerous exploits sacrifice men instead of animals. They even vow to immolate themselves, using the druids as their ministers for this purpose. They feel that the spirit of the gods cannot be appeased unless a man's life is given for a life. Public sacrifices of the same sort are common. Another practice is to make images of enormous size with the limbs woven from osiers or willows. Living human beings are fitted into these, and when they are set on fire, the men are engulfed in the flames and perish. The general feeling is that the immortal gods are better pleased with the sacrifice of those caught in theft, robbery or some other crime, but if a supply of such criminals is lacking, then they resort to the sacrifice of completely innocent victims. As well as this, Caesar also recorded that the Druids abstained from warfare and paid no tribute. Attracted by these undoubted perks, many joined the order voluntarily or were sent by their families. As part of their training, they would study ancient verse, natural philosophy, astronomy and the law of the gods. Druidic learning was presumably lifelong and some spent as long as 20 years just in the training phase. Druids were said to believe in the immortal soul that passed at death from one person into another. There is another notable account of the ancient druids that records one of their rituals, although the veracity can't be firmly established. It concerns the sanctity of natural settings and flora and how rites were conducted in forest groves. This testimony was given by the Roman historian Pliny the Elder in his Natural History in the 1st century AD. Speaking of the apparently magical mistletoe, he writes we should not omit to mention the great admiration that the Gauls have for it as well. The Druids, that is what they call their magicians, hold nothing more sacred than the mistletoe and a tree on which it is growing, provided it is a hard timbered oak. Mistletoe is rare and when found it is gathered with great ceremony and particularly on the sixth day of the moon. Hailing the moon in a native word that means healing all things, they prepare a ritual sacrifice and banquet beneath a tree and bring up two white bulls whose horns are bound for the first time on this occasion. A priest arrayed in white vestments climbs the tree and, with a golden sickle, cuts down the mistletoe which is caught in a white cloak. Then, finally, they kill the victims, praying to a god to render his gift propitious to those on whom he has bestowed it. They believe that mistletoe given in drink will impart fertility to any animal that is barren and that it is an antidote to all poisons. There is reasonable scholarly contention that the Druids and the Hindu Brahman castes were callbacks to a very ancient Indo-European ancestor priesthood. Later Roman rulers cracked down hard on Druidic practices, with the Emperor Nero presiding over a brutal purge on them on the Isle of Anglesey, then known as Mona. There were Roman raids on the island in 60-61 to AD and again in 77 AD. Slavery awaited those who survived as gang chains found in a lake in Anglesey and dated to 100 BC to AD 78 demonstrate. Druidism was, by the latter point of that date range, ostensibly dead in Britain as Celtic gods were merged with Rome's pantheon by the process of Interpretatio Romana. A fine example of this is the goddess Shulish Minerva, who was revered in the Romano-British settlement of Bath. But did some of the old ways survive? Did the order go underground and maintain its existence as a centuries-old clandestine conspiracy? To my mind, this is unlikely. But Britain was not done with Druids just yet. Interest in all things Celtic, Arthurian and Druidic surged during the 19th century. 
This could partly be put down to a yearning for a rural idyll as cities and towns rapidly expanded during the Industrial Revolution and William Blake's dark satanic mills sprung up, forcing hard-pressed lower-class people to leave the countryside to find work. Druidic societies and beliefs sprung up in Britain and the United States at around this time, set up by eccentrics looking to make a name for themselves. An early example of this was the antiquarian Edward Williams or Iolo Morganwig to give him his bardic name. Morganwig, something of a fraud and historical falsifier, founded the secret society known as the Gorseth, in which he successfully co-opted the 18th century Welsh cultural Eisteddfod festival for his own ends. An iteration of this organisation is the one in which the 20-year-old future queen was inducted into, but its foundations are, somewhat disappointingly, built on sand. So, to cut a rather long story short, King Charles III is most likely not a druid, and neither was his mother in any real historical sense. However, there was certainly an ancient Celtic tradition present at Charles's coronation, that of the Stone of Destiny, or Stone of Schoon. My previous video on the Stone of Destiny explores this further, and is linked in the description. This megalithic sandstone slab was placed beneath the coronation chair in a ritual that dates back many centuries and derives, via Scotland, from very ancient Irish king-making traditions. As is often the way in Britain, old habits die hard. That's it for this video. Don't forget to like, share and most importantly subscribe. And you can also support the channel on Subscribestar via the link in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.